All right, hello, Fortinos brothers and sisters. Welcome back. Unfortunately, well, no, okay, we know it'll be God's perfect timing. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is August 24th, 2024. And brothers and sisters, for those of you who are in the forum at Ministry Revealed, if you'd like to join and come uh, join like-minded brothers and sisters from all over the world, there's over 1,200 people in there. Go to ministryrevealed.com. Click on the link in the menu called Forum. It takes a few seconds, and it's free. You can come join us in there. We are still diligently seeking and searching. Yes, many people are going through tough times. It is it is crazy out there right now. We know uh, our, brother, our brother Steve and the ministry that he's got over there that we diligently support over in Uganda. Do you know, I just found this out the other day. He has taken in, I think, Five or six homeless people, younger kids and so forth, uh, even some into their 20s, I think, uh, into his home. Into his home. And now they're all sick. I don't know if the, there might have been yellow fever or something from one of them. And now they're all sick. They just all went to the doctor. He got medication for everybody. And uh, now they're recouping. This is what our brother Steve is doing. He is out there, his team, his family, putting themselves on the line. And they're out there. So we want to do and continue to do everything we can to diligently keep supporting them and helping them get the books printed, the Bibles, and everything that they need. You know, I even just got a message, uh, I think it was yesterday the day before, that there's the Ministry Revealed book, but there's also a little book that our sister Cindy has put together. And it's a, it's a little salvation book, and I believe her story. And this is it's a small book. It's like a little booklet. And it only costs, I think, $2 U.S. for them to get printed with his printer in Uganda. The ministers and pastors and everybody out there, through the tens of thousands of people that Steve has reached in the last year and a half doing this, a little over a year and a half, he says it's close to reaching somewhere in the neighborhood of even a million people because of that book. What? What? My head exploded when I heard that. Guys, they are hungry in Uganda, and Steve and his team are going nonstop, nonstop. You know, you might think Uganda, well, the dollar compared to Uganda money, I mean, that's not a lot of money. But brothers and sisters, I tell you what, there has been a good chunk of change sent to them over the last year and a half, and it is continuously gone because of how much it's getting used on printing books, buying Bibles, on, on the travels from the Uganda and into the Congo, um, um, having meals for, for the people that are coming, thousands of people from all different parts walking there day and night. It is absolutely incredible. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. To all of you guys for your prayers, for the support, it's it's so, so awesome. And I'm just thankful to be a part of it. Whew. All right, enough of that. <laughs> so with that, we're going to continue as well. But I, wanna, I want you to know something. I don't mean continue as in I think we're going to continue because... We've got another year or five years or seven or 14 years or anything like that before it starts. It is this year. This is the 70th year. We've proven it and can prove it over and over and over again with Scripture, with history, with, with the sun, moon, and stars. We can prove it. There's obviously just something that we didn't clearly yet understand. Well, I, was, I had my, uh, in prayer and in thought with the Lord a few days ago, uh, maybe a couple days ago now, I started considering something about the year's end. And that's what really struck me. And that's what today is about. And it turned out that we have a brother, Michael, uh, in the ministry as well from Australia, who was going down the same path, but in a, from a different angle. And when you see this, I'm going to show you two times what I believe are the only two options we have left. For this year and i don't mean i believe i'm uh, these have to be the only the only two options left and when you see them they both make sense 
I think one makes more sense than the other. I won't say which one. But at the same time, the other one still also makes a lot of sense because of things that I know of surrounding it. So we're going to look at both of them. I'm going to explain them to you. And remember that we are looking for the end of the winter wheat harvest. None of this has changed. We are Leia. Not kind of, not sort of. We are Leia. Okay? This is what we're looking for. Some people might say, oh, but you said it was coming here and you said it was coming there. Oh, yeah, I absolutely believed it. But what I know I believe, what I know I can absolutely prove is what the scriptures have revealed about the Feast of Weeks. We are going, the true Bride of Christ, the Leia, Feast of Weeks Bride of Christ, is going at the Feast of Weeks. It is the winter wheat, and it is at the end of the winter wheat harvest. The question is, where does that really begin? And we're going to talk about that today, too. Where does it really begin? Because that's the big question. Do you know that Scripture doesn't even tell us? Do you know nowhere in Scripture does it tell us where on a date to begin from so that we can understand the seven Sabbaths? Not one. Oh, we, we, we get Passover. We get unleavened bread. We get Feast of Trumpets. We get uh, atonement. We get tabernacles. All of those have a date. But the start date for the Feast of Weeks, which is supposed to be uh, at the Feast of First Fruits, Feast of First Fruits has no date. The seven Sabbath count, where it starts and what it would end at, has no date. What you're going to see today is probably going to help give us the understanding as to the reasoning why. Because it begins when the sickle is put to the wheat, corn or wheat, which means wheat here in Scripture because it's the Feast of Weeks, which is the wheat harvest. So, brothers and sisters, hold on tight. We're still in this. You're going to see that we are absolutely in it. It is not over yet, and we are still very close. We have understood the 70 years, and we're going to continue to bring about that understanding in this season and time that we're in right now. All right? And with that, man, <laughs> it's been, it's been a, a chaotic little while here in the ministry as well. Um, my truck, I went to go get a couple little things done to my truck because the engine light came on, and... I brought it in, and they said, oh, it'd be a few days for the parts. I said, well, you know what? We'll hold off for a couple weeks. Now that I know what it is, uh, it's, it's not a big deal right now. We'll hold off. They took it down off the hoist, and it started making a grinding sound. My back axle had dropped on what, like a heat protection plate or whatever it was, and he's like, you should be very thankful that it happened here because if you were driving down the street, he says your car would have stopped, and it would have destroyed a whole bunch more, and it would have been way worse. So – my car's in the shop. All of the rental cars were booked. We had to go all the way to the airport to find something to drive for the next five days. And uh, we were able to get one. We were blessed that they had it there. And you know what? Uh, I posted this in the forum, and I'm grateful that it happened the way it did because had it been going down the road, had it been a lot more expensive, I mean, this is already going to cost a lot of money, but at least it's not like probably the value of the truck of what the repair could have been. So. I am grateful. I think the Lord timed that perfectly. And, uh, you know, things have settled down. And then on top of it, today, my wife, I'm sure it happens with a lot of you guys out there, my wife makes us celebrate our dating anniversary. So today, uh, August 24th, is our 25th year dating anniversary. I, <laughs> I, I, I chuckle at it. I still feel like I'm 35 inside, and yet... My wife and I have been together 25 years, married November 18th, would be uh, our 24th wedding anniversary, um, but 25 years. Man, I just shake my head. So we went out for brunch today, and uh, she knows that I needed to get this done, and so uh, she's given me that little bit of time away on this special 25-year anniversary. So um, with that, too, I want you guys to know that 
we uh, we are going to do a live show, but I don't have time for a, I didn't have time for a live show today. Yesterday, of course, the the issues that happened with the truck, so I couldn't do it. And tomorrow we have our family dinner that we always have. You know, our ten of us all get together for a family dinner, and um, uh, so I won't be able to do it tomorrow night. So I wanted to get this done, and we'll do one very early next week, hopefully. Um, Monday even, you know, we'll see how it goes with you guys. We'll see what your times are like uh, as you respond in the forum, and uh, we'll go from there. All right? So with that, I'm not going to go into my long uh, portion that I would normally do, but for anybody that's new, you're going to hear things in the ministry like 14 years of tribulation and a portion called above. You're going to hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to. Everybody that comes to this ministry is recommended to watch this intro series first. There's 12 videos, but watch the first four videos to begin to understand the revelation of the word that has happened here. It is the prophetic revelation of the open books that were sealed until the time of the end. And we can prove it in all of the revelation that has been happening over the last seven years. So with that, brothers and sisters, let's get this started. And you know where I'm going to start? I'm going to start somewhere where those people who just want to get on the watchman and try to bring them down. You know, I think in some cases, I get it. It's just frustration. Believe me, I get it. Never once in this ministry have I ever said, a thus saith the Lord. And everybody who's been watching knows that. Everything has been a belief in the revelation to the timing in the understanding. The, the, the revelation is all true. It is the revelation of the Gospels. It is the revelation of the 14 years. It is the revelation from the beginning of creation. It is the revelation of, of the, the three harvests, the three feasts of the Lord. The true pre-trib bride is Leah, is going at the true feast of weeks. It's not maybe. These are absolutes revealed in Scripture. But the exact timing of these things has always been the issue. Remember, we're looking into things that people have been looking into for 2,000 years. The disciples and apostles thought at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple in around 70 AD that it was the time of Mark's discourse they had been compassed about and destroyed, and they were looking and waiting on the, on the return of the Lord. And then they had to endure, continuing and continuing and continuing and continuing because it wasn't yet their time. Well, one day it's going to be that time. And that time is here. This is the final generation. I've said it before, that if you take all of this time from when people believe Christ's birth was to the time of his death and resurrection, it's a specific piece of time from either 8 to 6 BC to about 0 or 1 AD. That's the period of his birth, and they'll have his death and resurrection anywhere from about 28 to 34 AD. That alone is the prophetic revelation. If you can understand within that parameter of time, if you understand what the scripture told us, if you understand the timing as we've shown, when Jesus in Luke chapter 3 declared the Jubilee. We know it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. If you know that was 28 to 29 AD, then you've got 29 AD, the Jubilee year count beginning. When you do that, you understand when Jesus' birth really was because it said he began to be about 30. And then you know that the time frame of his death and resurrection of the year. So if you can properly count the Sabbaths, and know that the Jubilee is the first year of the next set of seven, and you take that all the way through, guess where you get? Where we are right now. When this year ends, there are 14 years left before the final Jubilee. 14 years from now, when this year ends, in God's timing, and the 14 years begin, at some point this year, which we're going to talk about, <coughs> when those 14 are over, it's the Jubilee that counts all the way from when Christ first declared it in Luke chapter 3. You see, there's only a particular time frame based on Christ's death and resurrection, his birth, and what the scriptures have told us about it. 
We're in that time frame. It's just a matter of where is the Feast of Weeks and where is the Lord God's year's end. You see, there are many year ends or start and ends and starts of years within Scripture. There's a number of them. But where is the Lord God speaking to? Well, he goes from feast to feast, doesn't he? If the first one is Passover, with, is, is really unleavened bread, it says, right? Unleavened bread, they're to come to him, and that tabernacles is the last one? Well, then where's the year's end? And that's what got me going down this. I had been praying, as I said earlier. I'd been pondering these things in prayer, and the thought of the year's end came about. And so I'm not saying this is it in relation to it's one of these two. But in the revelation, I don't know what other two are left for this year. Because this is the 70th year, the true 70th year. The Leviticus 19 with the accession, non-accession, knowing where the Lord God would begin his count from. We were doing it from the kings. But what if the Lord God has his own timing? We'll talk about that. You'll see. And so what I'm going to do is even though I know some people are frustrated, I want to remind people of 2 Peter 3, verse 3 through 5. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Okay? Walking after their own lusts. Now, do I think everybody who, who's scoffing me and scoffing others that are talking about prophecy in the time frame that we're in, do I think that they're all, you know, the scoffers of those following after their own lusts? No, I think there's a, probably the majority that are just, you know, disheartened, that are a little bit saddened by these things. But what you're going to see here is the evidence that there's a group of people that would be telling everybody the time of the Lord is near and to be ready. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to you about people here that are going to scoff who? Those who are claiming the promise of the Lord is coming. Which means there would be watchmen in the last days proclaiming the time of the Lord is near. Hello. And the scoffers will just come to be a part of it. Are some of them the ones following, walking after their own lust? Sure. But again, I, I still have compassion because I believe the majority are still Christians that are just disheartened. The real nasty ones, well, that's a different story. Okay? Listen to what it says. Knowing this first, but that there shall come in the last days scoffers, which means they're scoffing somebody. Who are they scoffing? They're scoffing those proclaiming what? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water. You see, that means there's people proclaiming the coming of the Lord is near. Otherwise, you wouldn't get scoffers in the last days. You see, so not only does it prove that there are watchmen proclaiming this time, but it also tells you that if you are scoffing, you better repent. Repent. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. And just be patient. Be strengthened. Remember everything. If you've been watching in this ministry for any amount of time, remember everything that we've been revealed. The 99% the, the of the story of this ministry isn't the when. It's the revelation of the prophetic understanding of his word for the is to come. A people being prepared is the story. The revealing of his word in mysteries that had never been understand, understood before. And I we had a great reminder here in the forum today. Uh, a brother that had been with us for six years. Never heard of him before. It was the first time he came and posted in the forum. And I was so grateful for the message that he said. Because it is the revelation. And the timing is near. We can take a deep breath and just know that it's near. 
That's why understanding the timing of Jesus' birth and his death and resurrection within a period of time puts us in that period of time that we're in based on what it was. And when we look at everything going on around the world, I mean, come on. And <laughs> please note, I'm not only speaking this to you guys as a strengthening, I'm speaking it to myself as well. Because was I disappointed? Are there things now I can't fully comprehend and, and grasp? Yeah, definitely. Am I trying to understand, well, how would that play out like this? Well, we know when the end of days plays out. We know at coming of Mount Zion, when paradise is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, we know there's devastation and destruction. It's probably going to tilt the earth or throw the, the earth either to speed up or slow down or whatever that calculation equals. So could there be a difference within days? Absolutely. Absolutely it can. So whether things are a week or two off here or there, big deal. The revelation is the revelation. And the evidence has already been proven in it. So in this period of time that we're looking at, we're going to keep digging into this. And if it's one week, if it's two weeks, if it's a few days, we'll spend whatever time we have left, not only digging into it, talking about it, but we'll even bring other things. If it's, if it's the longer out one, not much longer, but you know, if it's the little bit further out longer one, then we'll keep doing teachings. We'll keep being strengthened and diligently seeking the Lord until. All right? So now with that, I want to share this with you guys. I thought this was awesome. This is um, our, our young brother. His name is Killian. And his father is our brother Mark. He's uh, in the ministry. They're from, uh, uh, I think they're in Australia. I was, I was thinking New Zealand. Sorry, I know what a curse that is to say. But I think they're in, uh, I think they're in Australia. And um, Mark's been with us for a while, and he's very active. And I wanted to share this because I think it's so awesome. I think it's beautiful when the children are also out there doing something, right? They're, they're speaking of the Lord. They're, they're trying to share. They're trying to reach more and play a part, right? And so I thought this was awesome. Uh, Mark had shared this with me. And again, this is his son, Killian who's uh who's sharing this right here so he's got some shorts right here um you can see it right here dusty puppy 12 bible reads so this is mark's dog i was asking him about if he had any pets we were just in a conversation and so this is a dog that's a good looking dog so but this is his son uh killian doing a strong's concordance uh reading for the number 55 let's have a listen hello and welcome to my channel i have another strong's Strong's 55, and the, the word is hagnos, and it means purely with pure motives. And the usage is purely, sincerely, with pure motives, honestly. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. There you go. See? A little something, and I just thought that was so awesome. I love it. It's exciting to see. And uh, thank you, Killian. Keep going, brother. Here's the other thing we've been talking about, right? Let's move on to this next thing. We know that the whole story of Iran and Israel is not going away. We know it. We keep saying this. We keep saying, well, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? <laughs> exactly. When is it going to happen? We know when it's going to happen. The scriptures have revealed to us when it's going to happen. It's going to happen right after the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ at the true feast of weeks. And the 50 days will then begin and it will start with an attack with a, uh, by Iran on Israel in Haifa and Tel Aviv, exactly as we have shown and explained numerous times in Isaiah chapter 9 with the light affliction typology of Ze in Zebulun and Naphtali. Before what? The one who walked in darkness has seen a great light. Right? For unto us a child is born. It's a picture of the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days afterwards. We know this is coming. It's not going away. They even said, there was a post we did, uh, somebody had posted in the forum that uh, um, uh, uh, one of their deputy uh, military or minister or something like that, that it was quoted. I mean, it was, it was in the Israeli papers. It was by CNN. And he said that the 
the timing will be uh, it will be at the perfect time and at the perfect place when they attack something along those lines and i thought man words we've been saying you see this is something i've also been praying to the lord about because i i don't like looking to an iran israel conflict as as a joyful time of prophecy i i really don't like it at all actually but the scriptures tell us this is what's coming we know at the moment of the pre-trib so don't look to to don't expect to see iran attack israel and in, in haifa in tel aviv and destroying it or or tremendously devastating it because the pre-trib bride will not see it all right it's going to happen right after might israel attack first and then iran returns with that we might see the israel one first but their timing will be perfect according to the lord god's prophecy all right it's still going on guys it's not going away it's even more tense than it's ever been so let's remember that as we go forward and let me show you this so we know the importance of 1949 just as this reminder of 70 of the five and 70 years for you guys i just put october 1st of 1949 might have been september might have been october we know that the years end whether we want to say the years of the kings right which would be tishri one or to the lord god's years end which we're going to talk about today we know that when they came into the land according to leviticus they came into the land and they were to plant trees they came into the land in 1948 they were to plant trees in well they planted trees in uh on february 14th i think it was 1949 they had now had their government but because they're the house of judah it officially in historical account doesn't begin until tishri one but the lord god's timing isn't tishri one the lord god tells us in scripture what his year's end is so instead of going to tishri one we're going to do it from account at his year end and see what we understand this year well the only thing you're going to find is that it's a difference of days that's why what i'm telling you this difference of days like what i say days it might be a week to two weeks okay so we're not going way out there because we have to be what we have to be at the time of the wheat of the winter wheat harvest coming to an end but this is what i wanted to show you guys if you go from 1949 the fall feasts plus 75 years means we're what we're in the 75 the 75th year which is exactly is exactly 100 percent what we are told in leviticus chapter 19. this is why i am not relenting on this time that we are still in of the count when you come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food um then shall thou count the fruit thereof uncircumcised three years so you come into the land plant the trees and then your year will begin the year won't begin till the end of the fall feast which is 1949 fall feast for three years now you can't take from it one two three years from 49 in the fourth year is to be brought to the lord and then in the fifth year is theirs which means in the fifth year it begins so what happens that would mean what one two three four and in the fifth year now their count begins which means we have to be what in the fifth and 70th so the fifth began the 70th so we are in the 75th year did did i make this number up i didn't make it up it was right there in scripture and when you understand that the ones who are in the land are the house of judah and not the house of israel it's very clear you just have that's that's a key piece that you have to understand and when you do we've got 2024 fall feasts of 2024 straightforward this is why i am adamant and diligent and will not relent over these next couple or so weeks because this is the 70th year and there are 50 days that come before the 50 years end uh, the 70th year ends so don't despair the pre-trib 
is absolutely 100% true. So is the mid-trib, and so is the post-trib. Above 14 years is that 50 days. It is those in Christ. They're going to be like a rapture. So it's not going to be the same type of rapture <laughs> that's going to take place in the mid-trib. It's I don't know what it's going to look like. But this group is going to be the Enoch group. They have completely will vanish. And they're going to go to the third heaven. The second group isn't quite the same strength of being in Christ as the first group was. They are the was caught up harpazo. And they're going to paradise. And we know paradise, Mount Zion, the Lord is coming down with it. We now know where it's coming from and where it was, where it is. And when he comes with it, this is where the was caught up group is going. So theirs is going to be like a translation from here to there. <coughs> and this place is going to be seen above the earth. And we know, of course, then it's talking about him coming the third time at the end in that 14th year. So we have a taking, a taking, and a return. And these things we know. Remember this, fragment 5 from the Apocrypha. As the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise, and others will possess the splendor of the city. Let's see what part 2 says, or the other page. Makes it more clear. But that there is a distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold, and that of those that produce sixtyfold, and that of those that produce thirtyfold, for the first will be taken into the heavens. Pre-trip. The second class will dwell in paradise. Mid-trib, seventh year of seals. And the last will inhabit the city. The return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's all true. It is the revelation of Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre, mid, post, spirit, son, father. <clears throat> all right? So we've understood these things. Don't let these things get you down because the timing hasn't happened. We know it's coming. Well, what else do we know? We know Leah, brothers and sisters. It's not a kind of, it's not a sort of, it's not a maybe. We know the, the revelation of 717 is 177 in the end of days. It is Feast of Weeks first. Unleavened bread as, as the mid-trib, great multitude rapture, and the seven of tabernacles for the end of the 14th year. And then the great eighth day of tabernacles is called the new beginning, and that is the start of the millennial reign, is the jubilee and the millennial reign. They will be restored all things. It's exactly, it is precisely what we were just reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and in the Apocrypha fragments. It is the timing of the pre, mid, and post. It starts with the Feast of Weeks, just as it does with Leah, who is the elder who was wed first. Leah, who he served seven years expecting Rachel, but got Leah first because it is the younger, uh, sorry, it is the older, the firstborn that goes before the younger. It is the difference of spring wheat and winter wheat, or Leah being winter wheat, and Rachel, who is the type in the spring wheat. The bride of Christ is connected to winter wheat, and we have proven it every which way from Sunday. Well, what did it say about her? The very first place in Scripture where the Feast of Weeks is used. But the Feast of Weeks is one day, yet this is a one-week-long wedding. But its connection is to the Feast of Weeks. We've known this, we've understood it, we've broken it down. It is true. And now let me show you this. This was shared from a brother of ours. A sip of water. You might think, hey, water, where's this coffee? I had mine this afternoon. <laughs> it's too much, man. I got another one tonight. So this was shared from our brother, Michael77. Uh, he's in Winnipeg here in Canada. And he's doing a great work as well sharing the word and doing studies with a group of people with him as well. And this is from the Zohar. Look at what it's called. <clears throat> the Zohar knows that the night of the bride is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Now, I wasn't going to share this. This might have been something I would have shared later. Uh, I was thinking about it even a couple weeks ago. But look at how fitting this is now. 
Zohar examines the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday of, of the weeks, when the presence of the of the Creator enjoins himself it enjoins itself completely to our physical world. Shavuot connects us to the original revelation of light that occurred on Mount Sinai. When is the when is the Lord coming as light? When he begins his forty days, right? We we even saw that in in Isaiah chapter nine. We know there's the light afflictions in the two places. And then the one who walked in darkness saw a great light. We know that it's the same connection. And it said occurred on Mount Zion. The union between the presence of God, the light of the, shi of the she Shekinah, and the physical world produced total perfection. The light on Sinai radiated with such intensity that it banished the dark forces of death and decay. Okay, And the Israelites experienced true immortality. They showed that the connection to the Feast of Weeks is connected to the bride. This is Leah, brothers and sisters. Just as we saw, it is Leah. But did you see what it said? When the presence of the Creator enjoins itself, himself, completely to our physical world. I want you to remember this, thing, this, this right here. When he will enjoin himself to this world. Because this is precisely the time that's upon us or approaching us that says the exact same thing. When the creator, when, when the king will be in the field where he could be now approached and enjoined with the people of the world instead of on his throne and impossible to get through except through guards and gates and hallways and and and, and magistrates and you know and boards and committees and everything before you can get to him but when he's in the field he enjoins himself with all the people this is really important because they show that the connection is to the bride and that it's at the feast of weeks that is leah and we know that right we know this with the winter wheat compared to spring wheat, as we've spoken on so many times. Well, listen to when it's harvested. So, and it's harvested. So winter wheat in the northern hemisphere, just like Jerusalem, is harvested in summer or early autumn, which means it could still go into September. Now, it's not very specific when it says early autumn, but obviously it can go later than what we might think, like right now. I would have thought right now was too late until people started sending me things. Until I started digging into it also after that myself. And then you realize, well, wait a second. If winter wheat is still being harvested, then maybe there is still a count that we're in to come to the tail end of the true feast of weeks, which is the winter wheat, Leah, bride of Christ. And if that's the case, well, then what is this 50 days that brings us to the end of the year? Hence, the importance of the year's end. All right. And not only the year's end, but the year's end that has to start with a count. At the end of the winter wheat harvest. For the bride of Christ at true Shavuot. Look at this one. This one's saying the same thing. Uh, winter wheat is generally planted between September and November, while harvest runs in the southern hemisphere from spring. Uh, spring wheat, da, 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 da. where is it, where is it, where is it? Yeah, I think that was it. Winter wheat generally planted in September and November, while the other one, what did I miss? Uh, June, while harvest starts in, there you go. While harvest starts in July and can finish in through September. Okay, but let me get more specific. I just want to show you guys some examples. Now watch this. This was shared in the forum. When is winter wheat harvested? That's pretty clear, right? Watch this. What are the winter harvest dates? Look at that. Some of them go from May to July. Watch this. One of them even goes to September 14th. Look at this one. Uh, where's another one? Uh... September 5th. 
September 8th. September 1st. September 5th. September 3rd. Which means what? Which means, brothers and sisters, we are still in it. The winter wheat has not completed. It's not over. If it's not over on the earth, why would it be over in heaven? As in heaven, so upon the earth. Hello. As in heaven, so upon the earth. This is very, very, very encouraging for us. You see, it's not over. It's not over. But not only not being over, wherever the over is, it needs to be connected to a wedding week. It needs to be connected to a 40 days of the Son of Man, and it needs to end 50 days at a year's end. All those things that we've spoken about over the years. So let's take it a step forward and see what the scriptures tell us about it. <clears throat> Here's the Feast of Weeks. Watch this. This is from Deuteronomy 16. What do we know in Deuteronomy 16? The three feasts of the Lord when there are to appear before the Lord. Uh, unleavened bread, seven days. I mean, you guys remember this, right? We've shared the, the revelation of Deuteronomy. This is another one of those things in Deuteronomy. It's not a maybe. It's not a kind of. It is the revelation of the end of days. What is it? Feast of Weeks is the pre-trib bride of Christ. Seven years, seven days as years, which is the bread of affliction, which is the seven years of seals, but it plays out as six years, and then on the seventh day or in the seventh year is the great multitude rapture. You have a solemn assembly. Then you have what? Then you have the seven days as seven years of tabernacles. And when the seven years as days of tabernacles are done, you have the eighth day of tabernacles, which is the new beginning. It's, it's the revelation. It's exactly what we've been sharing over the years. It is the revelation of the end. Seven years of seals, the Lord seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion. The seventh year is the solemn assembly. In the midst of the seventh year is the great multitude rapture. Seven years of trumpets, but they don't uh, uh, come back in the seventh year like the great multitude did in the seventh year of seals. The seventh year of, of trumpets is the destruction of the Lord, the, the great day of the Lord. And it's the year like Noah and the treading of the grapes. And when that's over, what is it? The eighth day of tabernacles is the new beginning. It is the jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign, which, as I was sharing earlier, this jubilee is a count that was revealed all the way from Christ declaring it in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar in Luke chapter 3. You think that's by chance? Nope. Nope. So, what does it tell us about the Feast of Weeks? What does it tell us about the Feast of Weeks? Watch this. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Listen to this. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn, which means wheat. How do you know it's wheat? Well, it's... It, it's crystal clear. How do you know that corn means wheat? Because, uh, where am I? Because, 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 where is it? Oh, uh, the first fruits. This is what I wanted. I wanted Exodus 34.22. This is why. In Exodus 34, 22, this is where actually I was brought to when I was pondering on these things. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest. You get that? Which means what? This is the feast of weeks. Which means the corn is talking about wheat. Just so you can understand that. So that's made clear. When does it say to begin to count it? <laughs> um, from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the wheat. 
Is it possible? Is it possible that the sickle wasn't put to the weed here? Or or where is it? Or down here? Is it possible because the wheat is a little further out this time? It was it was pushed a little bit further out? We know that the harvest literally began in this time. But to the Lord God, where did it begin officially exactly? The wheat is still being harvested. So if the wheat is coming to its tail end over the next week or two, <clears throat> then... Maybe it didn't officially start right in this time. Maybe it's somewhere in here where it officially began with the Lord God. Because according to Scripture, it says that you're going to begin to count it from such time as you put the sickle to it. There's never a date. This is what I was telling you guys earlier. Even when we go to Leviticus 23, you're supposed to count from what the sheaf of the wave offering. Well, the sheaf of the wave offering has no has no date. That one has no date, and the Feast of Weeks has no date. Is it because you have to wait until it's ready? And when is it ready? It was some, we saw that they were harvesting it in some places at this time. But what about the later ones? They probably started harvesting a little bit further north they went, they probably started harvesting a little bit later. So if the harvest is still taking place, maybe, just maybe, we have a little bit further than this time frame we were looking at. A lot further? No. I mean, according to that, the end of the winter wheat harvest is here in September. Does that mean it has to go all the way to here? No. But certainly in this time frame, certainly in this time frame is the end. And as I said, we're going to talk about those two time frames. We're going to see it right now. And first, let me show you this. In the Hebrew calendar, look at where they have the month of Elul. <clears throat> they have the first day of Elul going from the Tuesday night into Wednesday, which is supposed to be the beginning of the dark moon. Now, we've talked about this in the past. The Hebrew calendar, when it does its months, some months, day one is dark moon, but sometimes they're off. In On occasional months throughout the year, the dark moon doesn't actually happen right on that day. <clears throat> it could happen, usually, I don't know if it happens the day after, but on occasion, you'll see it more than once a year sometimes where it happens the day before. And what you're going to see is that's exactly what's happening this year. Okay, watch this. This is new moon, which is dark moon on the third, on the Tuesday the third. Okay? So according to what we were just talking about <clears throat> with, where am I? With it being here and not here. Now you might say, well, it depends what time. It depends what time because the Jews go evening to evening. Don't worry. I'm going to show you. Look at what it says. <coughs> Excuse me. Where is it? Where is it? Um, I was sure I had that brought up. I think that's just what this was. So you see it right here. And when you go to the time, I know I, I had it brought up did i bring the wrong yeah let me show you this one so this is moon phases in jerusalem look at what it says september 3rd at 4 55 a.m 4 55 a.m so at 4 55 a.m on the third jerusalem time is obviously the very early in the morning right here, right? Which means if it's very early in the morning and theirs go from evening to evening, then this is dark moon day, you see? This should be Elul 1, just so you're aware. Now, as the months go forward, does does it catch back up and account? <coughs> it does. 
but you need to know this is actually the that that end of it okay this is that dark moon day which would mean this would be the second okay and the second is of course that the start of the week okay so let me start going deeper into these two these two uh, accounts if we go back to here and we look right here we see it right here right cuz this is what what's the 22nd again not accounting for the 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 moon off as as we've done in the past let's just stick it with the hebrew calendar if it's off by a bit it's off by a bit we're just going to stick with the hebrew calendar all right here's your sabbath day this is the true sabbath just like these were the true sabbaths right the 8th 15 22nd 29 so what happens this would be the sabbath and this would be the beginning of a count so we know that it's sometime in this time frame we're, we're in the midst of this time frame from where we are right now until about the 14th latest of september so if this is the 22nd right the sabbath then this would begin the 50 days what if we look at the 27th of august as the beginning of the 50 days okay august 27th 2024 add 50 days brings us to october 16th watch this what is october 16th is this the year's end is this potentially the year's end if it's the year's end why would i call it the year's end when you still have the seven days of tabernacles why would this be the year's end because this is the start of tabernacles well i'm glad you asked <laughs> listen to what we have we understand this observing of the feast of weeks right now when i had gone through this in the past i started saying well wait a second thou shall observe the feast of weeks because remember there are three times in a year okay it says and thou shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest comma and means a separate one and the feast of ingathering at the year's end that means the feast of gathering is obviously at the year's end now we're going to talk about something else a little bit further down the road which is it seemed in reading this like they could both be observed right that you're going to excuse me that you're going to observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest comma and in addition to the feast of ingathering at the year's end but we can disprove this now and we're going to talk about that a little bit later because we just covered in deuteronomy right then we just cover this in deuteronomy what did deuteronomy tell us deuteronomy told us that there was the feast of weeks the feast of unleavened bread and the feast of tabernacles and what does it say three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the lord thy god in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread comma and in the feast of weeks comma and in the feast of tabernacles so you know what that puts an end to right that puts an end to the idea that what this is saying here is that we're going to observe both of these at the end of the year there was a point in time where i had believed this was possibly happening but clearly it can't because there's three times in a year <clears throat> if there's three times in a year when you're to observe these feasts and the people go to jerusalem to the lord to observe them why would you have three separate ones if this one they're going to be there already with this one it's because it's not there are three separate feasts of the lord <clears throat> excuse me at three separate times all right but my focus here is this year's end because all of my year ends had been based on the feast of trumpets on the feast of trumpets 
And what I was just showing you here, that brought us to the 16th of October with a count that began with 50 days right here on the 27th of August, gives us 50 days to what? To right here, and then this begins the year's end, right? Because the Feast of Ingathering is at the year's end. Hello. So the Feast of Ingathering is Tabernacles. But is day one of Tabernacles the year's end? Or is the last day of Tabernacles the year's end? You see, this is a feast of ingathering at the year's end. This feast is going to last for seven days at the year's end. Does it mean day one is the year's end? Or day seven is the year's end? So there's, there's two points in this, whether it's day one or whether it's day seven. And this we're going to we're going to assess both of these. But what I want you to understand also is that we are not looking to the feast of ingathering as being connected to what we are looking for in relation to the pre-trib. The bride of Christ is the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest. And it is the winter wheat Leah bride of Christ of true Shavuot. That is what we're looking for. And we know that 50 days from that point has to bring us to a year's end. So the question is, the year's end is being told to us that it is the Feast of Tabernacles. So does the Feast of Tabernacles year's end mean this is the beginning of the year this is the year's end and there's the beginning of the 14 years or is this the year's end and the beginning of the 14 years okay this is what we're going to be breaking down because you're going to see it, it it starts to get pretty clear that there are two options there are two portions connected to this now as we look at this where are we where are we <clears throat> As we look at this, look what happens when we have our pre-trib, you know, whether it's early in the morning here or connected within here. Remember, we're still applying all the same things as we did the last couple of weeks. And the point of what we're connecting, <coughs> excuse me, is we don't know for sure if it's evening to evening or if the Lord God goes from daytime, sunrise to sunrise. Okay? If he goes from evening to evening, we could be looking here. If he goes sunrise to sunrise, well, then we'd be looking right about here. And, of course, you'll remember that. We got that. We see it actually in a couple places. We see it in Luke as well. But you'll remember that here in John chapter 20. Because it might be that at the death and resurrection of Christ, the light has come and is now light to darkness. And we see that here, that on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early while it was yet dark. So it's being called the first day of the week. And it's early, like dawn, while it's yet dark. See, it's actually dawn. It tells you it's dawn, which means it's just right before that sunrise. But then when we come further down, and he had said, don't touch me, he's ascending to the Father. We then see in John 20, verse 19, the same day at evening. How can you have the same day at evening unless you go from a day to day when it began in a day count from his resurrection that means the evening, if he's coming on the same day at evening, that would seem to indicate that it goes from sunrise to sunrise, okay? But we're not going to just say, oh, absolutely, that's what it is. It might be an evening to evening, but it also appears to be more of a sunrise to sunrise, okay? Which means it'd be the pre-trib, dawn, really early in the morning, and the 50 days begin, okay? So now watch what happens. The 50 days now begin. Let's just do it like this for the... Oh, actually, you know what? Let's just go from the dates. <clears throat> you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What do you know this date is, guys? 
Well, this is actually where Elul should be, right? We know that the Lord is coming back on the eighth day. The Lord is coming back on the eighth day. We have seen this and we have understood it. We even know it from here. If it goes from day to day and he came back the same day at evening, he anoints the, the uh, apostles and he leaves. And when he comes back, about an eight days later, he comes again. We saw this. We see this in Luke chapter 9. We have broken this down. It is everywhere. We've understood this. And when he comes, he's coming to do what? He's coming to fulfill the story of Jonah. He's coming to fulfill the prophecy of the sign of Jonah. No sign shall be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. This generation is the final generation. That's what it means. Jesus did not fulfill these signs of Jonah in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. We have proven it scripturally. And it's a major part of contention in the differences in the Gospels, which is why when you watch that intro series, you'll begin to understand what these differences are telling us in Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre, mid, and post. So we know he's coming to fulfill the 40 days as Jonah. We also know that there's a typology of Moses when he came to fulfill the 40 days. Well, what are these 40 days? Well, it would begin... At Elul 1. Remember, this would just be right here. Which means he's coming to start his 40 days on the 8th day. And when he does, it would be Elul 1. What is the month of Elul? What happened in the history of the month of Elul? Moses remained on the mountain for 40 days from the 1st of Elul to the 10th of Tishri. Hello. 40 days of Moses as a typology with Christ. And what do we see in the Mount Transfiguration? Christ is there on what? About an eight days after these sayings in Luke chapter 9. Moses is there. And of course, the Elijah, like the Elijah company, when he returns from the seven-day wedding, which is the seven-day Leia wedding. And when he returns on the eighth day, we know he's coming to the Elijah company and the Moses group. And you've got the 40 days of the Moses group there with the Lord at what they have historically in Judaism when one of the 40 days of Moses began at Elul 1. Funny how that works, right? What about this? You also know it was the same thing with Jonah? I have no... Oh, there we go. I say, why did it jump down so far? Uh, the upcoming month of Elul is an, is an excellent time to think about Jonah because it is a month of preparation for beginning a new year on Rosh Hashanah. You see, because Rosh Hashanah is a new year. For Yom Kippur, uh, when we examine our lives and deeds. Elul also comprises much of the 40 days of favor that ends on Yom Kippur's period where we can find the exact same mercy and grace extended to us as the Ninevites found in their 40-day period of repentance because Noah's narration often symbolizes the same time. So we've got what? We've got Jonah. We've got Moses. Both of them being an account of Elul 1 for 40 days. Interesting how that works, right? And that would be a count from the pre-trib happening between here and here. So here was our first week. Here was our second week. And here is the third week. So a difference of two weeks. Oh, my goodness. These two weeks have felt like, like two months. Man, that just dawned on me. Oh, my goodness. It's only been not even two weeks since, since our first highest of all high watches whoa it feels like a long time has passed so here's the next this would be the seventh sabbath and then bang the end of the seventh sabbath whether it's evening to evening or day to day what else do we have in the meaning of elul the king is in the field okay the king is in the field 
It's a month of repentance and mercy in which, uh, in which there is extra closeness between God and his creation. That's exactly what it is, guys. Between God and his creation, this extra closeness that takes place. Look at what we have about the king is in the field. For 11, it talks about, I won't go through all of it, but through 11 months out of the year, as I was talking about earlier, the king is always on his throne. He's, he's virtually impossible to get through. You have to go through what? The, the palace walls and the bureaucracy, through all of this, through the veil to get to the king. But what happens? Through the veil of opulence, the majesty is a very real part of the farmer's field. Uh, then we see do, 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 that the king ends up in the field. Do, 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 where does it talk about? If you want to go look at it, just go look up here. Just at uh, uh, Chabad.org and uh, Elul chapter 1. What happens is the, the king at the time of Elul every year, the king would go into the field and would be among the citizens. So he would be close to them. He wasn't hard to get to. He was now at a place where the people could come to him in the field. Okay? They could see the king who was in the field. He was out there with them. They could ask him questions. They could see him and come to him without all of these difficulties compared to when he's sitting on his throne. Remember when I told you to remember that? Remember this? This time of the bride connected to a period close with the Shavuot Feast of Weeks where the presence of the Creator enjoins himself completely to the physical world? It's, it's the same time frame. I just thought that was really cool. We've talked about this over the years. Many people have. But we have an understanding of the timing because we know this 50 days comes first. So you see this, this connection that's taking place? What about this? Again, here it is for Elul chapter 1 and the meaning of Elul. A month of reflection on the previous year, looking forward to the next. And then look what it says, the spiritual meaning. This belief underscores the significance of Elul as a month of preparation where individuals spiritually prepare themselves for this divine judgment. Well, remember, that's exactly what Jesus was saying, right? In Luke chapter 19, when the Son of Man comes for 40 days, we know that the prophetic revelation of Luke 19 is the timing of him coming for 40 days. This is that period when he now comes to weep over them. And it says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And, thou sh and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. What is he warning of? <clears throat> well, we know at the pre-trib, when the pre-trib happens, the attack from Iran on Haifa and Tel Aviv, there's a short Middle East war that will last for about the seven days. The Lord returns on the eighth day. That war will have been settled. People don't want World War III to break out. Little do they know it'll still be coming. And now the Lord is here for 40 days at Elul 1, like Moses, like uh, Jonah, in, in the same prophetic picture that scriptures give us, in the same time frame, when the Lord is going to come and warn that they're shortly to be compassed about Jerusalem itself, not in the north anymore. And when they're compassed about, then they're going to be destroyed. And we know that's Syria. <clears throat> Excuse me. That brings us back to the same thing from Isaiah chapter 9. The light affliction, the light of Yeshua comes and shows up. He's there for 40 days warning, as he said he would as Jonah. And then Syria and the Philistines come, and Jerusalem is then destroyed. Right? <clears throat> We've understood this. This is what he's talking about. And it's the exact same wording that he tells us in Luke chapter 21. In the picture of him being here, warning the same way, in the 50 days, in this 40-day portion of the 50 days. 
And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. What did he just say? Compassed about in chapter 19. Compassed with armies. Then know that the desolation of thereof is nigh. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst depart of it, depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. For they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Red horse rider goes out, right? And shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This, of course, we know is the beginning of the red horse rider. And they will be scattered at the destruction of Jerusalem and the beginning of the 14 years. This has to happen. As we've known for a long time, at the, connected from the end of the 50 days at the year's end, which means what? <clears throat> that the, the next day has to be the beginning of the year. Do you understand why in all of this, when I was, when, when I was prompted, I believe in prayer, that the Lord already told us where his year's end is. The year's end has to be the end of 50 days and the beginning of the year, the start of the 14. So what do we see in this? Well, either this is the year's end, which is everything I just explained, and this is the start, or this is the year's end, and this is the start. It could only be one of the two. You see, because if Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingathering, is called at the year's end. And when they've brought everything in at this point, then this celebration is taking place in the year's end. So it could be this is the year's end and this is a celebration time. But it could also be that this is the year's end and this is the beginning. Hello. We just saw great comparison in this to realize the start of the 40 days being connected to to the king being in the field him being here with the people the the feast of weeks somewhere in this time frame taking place where the pre-trib can still happen based on winter wheat You understand this is still extremely extremely high watch in fact it's going to be more high watch than the others were the obvious point is because we're still here but the even more obvious point is what it reveals to not only the year's end but the end of the weed harvest the start of the lord being in the field when the king is in the field you see there, there's absolute reason in this. But it's not the only one. It's not the only portion, right? There is still another way to look at this. There's one more way to look at this <clears throat> as a possibility. And what would that be? Well, this is what? This is the Sabbath, which would mean in an evening to evening, it could be here, right? It could be here, which is the Elul one, right? So it could be here in an evening to evening or in a sunrise to sunrise where we could be looking around the third, right? In here in this time frame, that third to the fourth. And then what are we looking at? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hello. If this is the end and this is the start of it, you see, in this time frame right here, we've got seven days to the 10th of September. Which, remember, we're still in it. One was talking of the 11th. The other one was talking the 14th. We are still in the tail end within the first couple weeks of September. But what would that mean? That would mean the pre-trib pre could happen 
at Ilua 1, but we don't have the 40-day connection <clears throat> as him coming on the eighth day as Jonah or as Moses. Right? We're missing that. But it's not the only thing that we're looking to understand. It doesn't mean that because it, it was believed to be at Elul 1 that this is where it's going to be again. Maybe that's not really a little one. You know what I'm saying? It's the count of this specific time. And sorry, I don't mean that this is not a little one. I mean that maybe with Moses and maybe with uh, um, with Jonah, it wasn't precisely at a little one. It's not documented that it was at a little one as far as I know. I know for sure Jonah wasn't. Like they don't know for sure. They just believe it based on the connection with Moses. So I'm going to show you this other possibility. As much as this one looked pretty wow and brought us to a year's end, is it necessarily the year's end if the end of tabernacles is still part of the year of the feasts? Remember what Scripture said? Let me remind you. Remember Deuteronomy 16? Three times in a year. Three times in a year. So these are three times in a year. Shall thou males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. Yeah, pre-mid post, right? Or, yeah, in, in the Feast of Weeks, then past, then Unleavened Bread, and then Tabernacles. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. Which means what? The Feast of Tabernacles is in the year. The Feast of Tabernacles is in the year. So, if this isn't the end of the year, the year's end, it's just the time frame of the year's end when all the harvest is finally brought in so that they can have a celebration, then if this isn't the pre-trib, then the pre-trib's connected to somewhere around here. Right? After the seventh Sabbath, pre trib, and the fifty days begin uh, the fifty days begin. Which would mean the fifty days are beginning on a Lul one. And again, if the Moses and Jonah connection are there in the first one, it, it's not really the same timing. He's coming back in a Lul. It just wouldn't be a Lul one. But let's have a look to see what these things do equal. Because look what happens. In a September 3rd new moon, look at where the first quarter moon, which means the next week starts. September 11? September 11? You remember that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which means the eighth day at the coming of the Lord for 40 days would be connected to September 11th would be the beginning of his 40 days. Everybody knows at least the one big connection to September 11. Everybody had talked about how that was a, 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 like a spit in the face a, 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 against the Lord. Something connection with this connection to September 11th. So we've got something significant that took place in the world at that point. But we also have something else that happened, right? We have a brother of ours here in this ministry that I've spoken about, uh, you know, maybe two, three, four times over the last several years that did something very significant. And it was our brother Steve. Uh, I think he's in New Zealand, if I remember correctly. And he had sent this to me a few years ago when he had done this. He, had, he took a fast. He had a full 40-day fast. And at the end of it, you guys know my story. When I had prayed quietly, nobody knew it when I was in the shower. Lord, please confirm to me the 50 days, and then I've understood that I'm on target, I'm on track, and I've understood what I revealed here about the March 10th, 2020 video. And lo and behold, I get the message from, from uh, uh, Jodell, Later, well, very early in the morning, like 1 o'clock in the morning, I see it, I open it. You guys know the story. 
I was confirmed by the Holy Ghost. I know what it means to say and, and what could come if I'm lying about this, that the Holy Ghost told me this, to say that she stopped at the 50-minute mark in my video, just like I'd asked for, a 50-minute mark, a 50 number to catch my attention, and then told me, the Holy Ghost told me, right on target. That revealed everything of the count from Taurus in the beginning and all of this understanding in the revelation in relation to the beginning in Taurus and everything. Well, this is what happened in his sense to our brother Steve. When he had completed the 40-day fast, he asked the Lord, uh, I think it was along the lines of, when am I going to see you, Lord? And he audibly, now you have to remember, a 40-day fast fast the lord is he gives rewards for these things right he rewards us in doing the works and there is great reward in a drawing close in a fast so you can imagine a 40-day fast and in this 40-day fast when it was over he asked the lord lord when will either we see you or when will i see you and the lord audibly he heard 9-11 so for years, he had understood September 11th. He had understood. He, he was as committed to that as I have been in showing you guys the understanding of in the beginning being Taurus and what that represents to the count of the end of days. We know it. It can never be taken away from me, and that can never be taken away from him. But over the years, it wasn't really jiving, Right? Times would come and go, and maybe there was something, and then, of course, it would go away. But here we are now, in the 75th, of which the 70th is this year in the count. And for that to have happened, where we know an eighth day is what? The Lord returning for 40 days. Hello. Now there's a possibility. Did he, did he maybe think it was going to be connected to the pre-trip? Possibly, but when we talked about this again just recently in the forum, he thought it was probably more likely that it was at the Lord's coming for 40 days because he said, Lord, when am I going to see you? Well, at the pre-trip, the Lord's not coming down. It's a vanishing. People are going to vanish. There is no seeing the Lord. And what are we? We're a remnant group being prepared to serve the Lord. And a remnant group being prepared to serve the Lord are going to what? See him on the eighth day when he returns and has a banquet with them. The banquet that comes after the seven-day wedding. The banquet that he's going to come with though, for those that he's going to gather and open their understanding. As that remnant Luke 24 group, as that Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, that remnant group of workers who will put their necks on the line. This is that group he's having the banquet with. So for him to say 9-11, when am I going to see you? And here he is a part of a remnant group of workers being prepared in the revelation of the Lord so that when he returns on the eighth day, he can complete the story and they'll follow him for 40 days. So when are they going to see him? Well, from an Elul 1 count, it would be September 11th. Now that's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. You see, what drew me to this was this piece again from the Apocrypha in the Gospel of Thomas, or the Book of Thomas. When the disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be, Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For in the beginning, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. This could have two applications, couldn't it? What is the beginning and the end from the beginning? Well, it was Taurus. But we know when the 50 days are over, it's the end and it's also the beginning. It's the end of the, of the is, right? It's the pre-trib and the final 50 days and the end of days, the 14 years will begin. So it also made me think of this, this end and this beginning taking place again. So what does this count give us? Well, let's see what this gives us. I want to see, keep, make sure I'm staying on my, on my track here. Watch, let's see what this gives us. Well, first of all, 
you guys will remember, as I, as I was saying in the beginning, here's your 50-day portion coming to an end in the 70th year, and then the 14 years will begin. Yes, I believe it was Feast of Trumpets because a year's end and the start of a year. Now, let me be clear of this also because there's going to be a number of people that are going to say, well, I thought when the six years ends, the Lord is coming uh, on heavenly Mount Zion, and it's going to be on the day and hour no one knows, which means it will start at the Feast of Trumpets for the seventh year of, of seals. It will. It will be the Feast of Trumpets. The day and hour no one knows is the Feast of Trumpets. It doesn't change. You might just think, well, if this isn't going to start until the beginning or the end of Tabernacles, then why wouldn't the six years or after six days be the end of Tabernacles? Well, remember what happens in all the devastation. Is it possible that the Lord's coming with heavenly Mount Zion, that it, that it moves the earth? A lot of people believe it will, because if we look at what happens in the sixth year of seals, that might be something that accounts for it. But on top of it, it still is essentially six years. It's the fall feast to the fall feasts. We see right here that when the sixth seal is open, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, the hair, uh, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. I mean, this is going to be a mighty, mighty shaking and people freaking out and hiding in the rocks and cliffs and everything saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So this could highly likely, as many people have talked about over the years, be what corrects potentially the course of the earth and, of course, the calendars. We know the sun and the moon will be ashamed and confounded when he comes with Mount Zion. So could it be where this is a correction that adjusts that? It very well could be. But even if it doesn't, even if that's not the point, it makes no difference that the seventh year of seals and the end of trumpets to the seventh year of trumpet judgments can still be the Feast of Trumpets. Because the Feast of Trumpets is the day and hour no one knows. It doesn't change that. Just so you're aware, it doesn't change that. Okay? So now, look at what we know. We know it's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. Well, what did we just discuss earlier about this? We know it's the Feast of Weeks. The bride goes first, the pre-trip. Then you have your seven days as seven years of unleavened bread, of which six of them are the bread of affliction, and then the seventh is the solemn assembly. Then what do you have? Then you have the seven days as the seven years of trumpet judgments, which are the seven days of tabernacles. But is there a solemn assembly on the seventh day of tabernacles? No, the solemn assembly is on the eighth day. It's on the eighth day. Why? Because it's the Jubilee. And what happens in the Jubilee? It's called the new beginning. They're all brought back. Remember from mid-trumpets, they fly away on the wings of eagles at the ten and a half year mark for three and a half years to the end of the 14th. They're brought back at the time of Jubilee, <coughs> which is a picture of the eighth day from the seven days to the eighth day of tabernacles. And the eighth day is the solemn assembly, just as the solemn assembly was in unleavened bread on the seventh day in tabernacles, it's the eighth day. But the eighth day is also called what? The new beginning. It's the beginning of the millennial reign. Which means what? The seventh day or the seventh year of tabernacles is the end. And the eighth day is the new beginning. What are we looking for? <laughs> what are we looking for? Of course, we are looking for the end and the beginning. We're looking for what is this year's end. Is it the beginning of tabernacles? Or is it the end of tabernacles? And look at what we have. In Leviticus chapter 23, here's the seven days of tabernacles. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. 
and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. Do you know the only other place in the feasts where it's called a solemn assembly? Is in Deuteronomy. So out of all the feast days of the Lord, finding the word solemn assembly only happens in Deuteronomy chapter 16 for tabernacle, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, for uh, unleavened bread on the seventh day, which is precisely in the seventh year when the great multitude mid-trib rapture happens. And when we go to Leviticus chapter 23, when it says seven days offer an offering made by fire, on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offer made by fire. It is a solemn assembly. And what do we know? The solemn assembly will begin when? At the Jubilee. What is the Jubilee? Of course, the Jubilee is when they will all be returned from where they were protected in, in the wilderness, when they flew away on the wings of an eagle when they will be brought back, given their division of land, and the millennial reign start. Funny how that works, right? Solemn assembly in the seventh, solemn assembly in the eighth, exactly as the prophecies reveal. Another little nugget pulled out of that to show us the times of the solemn assembly. So if that's the time of the solemn assembly, then what is the eighth day and what does it mean? Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, represents the millennial reign. Well, the seventh day does, uh, the seven days don't. It's the eighth day. The eighth day represents the new heaven and the new earth of eternity. Well, in the big picture of everything, you're darn right it does. Because what is the revelation of the end of days? It's the revelation of all creation. Seven, seven. 7, 1, 22. What is the 22nd year? Right? What does it represent prophetically? When the thousand years are over, which is what? Which will be 21,000 years having come to an end. It's a picture of the seven easy years, the seven years of seals, the seven years of trumpets. In the big picture of all of creation, with the gap theory of Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, compare to the six days to the seventh day of creation. Compare, which is what? Days as thousands. And then from Adam, we are in the thousands, but to the Lord, they are still as days. And when the seven thousandth is over, it will have been the end of 21 days to the Lord. Or if we were there in time the whole way through, it would have been as 21,000 years. And what is the new heavens and the new earth? The 22nd thousandth year starting, which is eternity, which is what? In the picture of the seven easy, seven of seals, seven of trumpets, it's the picture of the jubilee of the 22nd year. It's the year's picture, it's the day's picture, to the year's picture of prophetic revelation at the end of days, to the big picture from the beginning of creation to the end of everything and the new heavens and the new earth, which starts when? It's represented by the eighth day. Because when the millennial reign is over, it's the eighth day of tabernacles as the seven years of seven days, seven years, 7,000 as trumpets. Judgments, which represents tabernacles, and then the eighth day, which is the jubilee, the millennial reign, and when it's over, in the big picture, it's the eighth day, the new heavens, and the new earth. Wait a second, what's the eighth day? It's, not, it, it's the new beginning. The eighth day is the new beginning. Huh. <laughs> the eighth day is the new beginning. Well, how does that play out for us? Let's go have a look. Let's go to the calendar. Let's go see what it tells us this way. 
if we've got the timing of the pre-trib, we've got our seven days, which takes us to the 10th of September. Then we've got the Lord coming on September 11th, which is the eighth day. And it just so happens it is the eighth day. Oh, my goodness. Could that actually be it? <laughs> it's on, on the calendar. It's the eighth day. <clears throat> it is September 11th. It lines up with our brother's audible. And what does this begin? Well, it begins the 40 days and 50 days. So where does the 50 days in all of this end? Well, let's go see. From the third, right? Forward, 50 days. We end up on October 23rd. Where does October 23rd take us? Well, lo and behold, the last day of tabernacles. If the year's end is the Feast of Tabernacles, is this the new beginning? Or is this the year's end? You see, the whole thing of tabernacles is the celebration at the year's end. So either this is the last day, and this is the beginning, which, you see, even though Elul and these other connections are there in the first portion I shared, there's still some things that make you say, Ugh, because how was this the end? It is the end when all the harvests are brought in and everything in relation to the very end of tribulation and everything with, with tabernacles. But, you know, this is going to relate more to the wedding. That seven-day wedding at the end, right? But, you see, this is where, this is why I'm scratching my head and why I've given you the two options. This is either the year's end or this is the year's end because all of this is called the year's end. It's the, it's the celebration of tabernacles at the year's end. But we saw tabernacles was within the year. And the Lord's year is feast to feast. So it seems still probable or, you know, which one's more likely? You can see on the front end, other things have a lot more connection. This one has a lot more connection on the back end, where the last day of 50 would be right here. And then look at that. The eighth day of tabernacles, which we know is called the new beginning of, Ju of which would be the Jubilee, which we know is called the new beginning. And in the big picture is eternity for the 22nd thousand that is now the new heavens and the new earth it falls in line with something that is the end and is the beginning so now you see <clears throat> why i wanted to show this as an end and this as an end and how we have a count that ends with 50 days here that is prophetically connected with the 40 days very clearly they're both connected still with the Feast of Weeks of the winter wheat coming to an end. So that's not the issue. The only question is, what is the year's end? And if we were strictly going on the year's end, I would say the last day of, of tabernacles is the end because we know that the eighth day, which is in Scripture, is the solemn assembly in New Beginning, which is when all of those, remember this? Which was the same thing with this connection we have to the book of John. John chapter 7, that had been a head scratcher for us for a long time. Why does John chapter 7, in our chapters to years, why does John chapter 7 talk about tabernacles? What's the point of it talking about tabernacles? Why would, the, why would the Lord be telling us about tabernacles here? And I've said this in the past. I believe the purpose for tabernacles being mentioned here is a picture. Remember when I talk about this, as I, we bring this to a close, remember when I talk about this with the chapters to years? Where the events are <clears throat> that are mentioned within these chapters that give us insight to the prophetic end of days they could relate to the beginning of the year in the middle of the year at the end of the year could be playing throughout the whole year the the picture 
isn't an event that necessarily is is all throughout the year. It could be picture of the start of it, the middle of it, the end of it, all of it. Well, I believe that the commentary and and the 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 conversation about the feast of weeks that's taking place here isn't because it's showing us that everything is going to start like the 50 days and everything will start at tabernacles we go here and the 40 days of the lord start here no it's impossible because there are three times you come to the lord at three separate feasts there is no winter wheat down in october and when you understand the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat and the three feasts of the lord you know we can't the pre-trib leah isn't spring wheat she is the older she is the winter wheat it's a fact which means we know that they're not observed together that's why i was sharing that to you in the beginning they cannot be observed together there's three separate feasts to come at three separate times to observe with the lord which means what? Which means in John chapter 7, the purpose of it was for the Lord telling us where the year's beginning and end was. He's telling us the end of the year. Now it starts to make a little bit more sense. And look at what he calls it. In John seven thirty seven, the last day is called what? It's called the last day, which is the eighth day is called that great day of the feast jesus stood and cried if any man thirst and come to me and drink he that believeth on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water do you guys remember what i said about john chapter 20. you guys will have heard this even from pastors it's a circle it starts it and it ends it we have a prophetic picture of the pre-trib bride going but what else do we have we have a picture of the end of the 13th, start of the 14th year. Hello. We know it started from Genesis and goes to Revelation, but it's this looping circle that's replaying it again, which is the 777 and then 22. All of creation replaying and compacted in the 21 years, the seven easy, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, and then the Jubilee, which is the 22nd at the new beginning. And when the, when the 14th year is over, and we know it's the Jubilee, what do we know happens? Well, when we go to our chapters to years, what do we see? What do we see in our chapters to years? We see in Ezekiel 47 to 48, that end of the 14th year and start of the 15th year. Let's go to Ezekiel. And we'll see the same wording that Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 7. He's showing us, I believe, he's showing us the end of the year and then where everything starts, meaning where the 14 years would then begin. Look at what it says. Ezekiel 47, this is when the waters will now flow. It's a picture of that end of that 14 to the start of the 15. The waters will flow from Jerusalem. And when this happens, what, what do we see? All of the tribes returning to their land, receiving their portion, which is exactly what happens in a Jubilee year. They will all be returning with their promised return portions of land. All land will be returned back to them. All judgment is over. And the millennial reign will begin. When does it begin? It begins at the Jubilee, which is a picture of the eighth day, seven to the eighth day of tabernacles, in the big picture, 22. And in this new beginning, the water flows out from the Lord and replenishes the world, and they all come back into their land. What is it? It's the end. So what do you think it would be over here? The beginning. It would be the beginning and it would be the end. On the 22nd day of Tishri, 
the great eighth day, the new beginning, making the end of tabernacles, the seventh day, the end. So brothers and sisters, I hope this helps strengthen you. I hope it helps encourage you that we are either looking from around the 26th to the 27th, or we are looking from about the 2nd into the 3rd, 27th of August to the 3rd of September. They are both very valid points. They both hold their weight in Scripture and in history and in, in the prophetic of it. Now, we will wait and see. We will diligently seek and search and share. We will do everything we can to help reach others along the way. Pray for Steve and for his team, brothers and sisters, because this is going to be posting tonight by the time I'm all done. So, prayerfully, this <laughs> is the final one. But if not, we'll have one more week from next Tuesday to go. And in everything that we have understood, in everything that has been revealed, we know Leah. We know unequivocally it is Leah, the elder. And the time of the winter wheat to the seven day wedding of the bride of Christ has a period within here to the end of the winter wheat harvest to be complete. So brothers and sisters, let us stand strong. Let us encourage each other. Let us lift each other up. Let us help each other, support each other. Let's do everything that we can in these final moments, in these final moments of the 70th year, the 5 and 70. It is at the end of the feasts, of the fall feasts of 2024. Is it going to be to the beginning of tabernacles? Or is it going to be to the end of, the tab uh, of tabernacles? Because brothers and sisters, that is the only question I have left. From the beginning of tabernacles or the end of it. Because the Lord has told us that this is his year's end. There are many years ends. But there is only one that scripture tells us is the Lord God's year's end. And it's the Feast of Tabernacles. So with that, brothers and sisters, I pray it blesses you. I pray it strengthens you as it has done all these things to me, as well as everybody in the ministry, and all of their sharing, all of their encouragement over me and over each other. I am grateful. I appreciate it. Prayers and strength for Steve as well and his family and his team and all of them over there for all of the incredible work they're doing for the Lord. And for each and every one of you, those of you struggling physically, those who are struggling mentally, uh, financially, we will pray over you, we will lift you up, and we will do everything we can in these final few moments to go into it strong together. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.